All right. So it looks like we're ready to answer some questions here. One of the first questions that's come in is what are the chances of losing our, our Second Amendment rights if you elect me? The chances are absolutely zero. The reason why is because I come from a hunting and fishing family. Growing up, my, my dad was an oil field worker and my mom was a school field, or a, sorry, a school secretary. As such, we had a gap in our income. My dad enjoyed hunting and in Wyoming, where I spent my childhood, it was actually fairly easy and cheap to hunt. So many of our, our supplemental meat came from my dad hunting. I grew up around guns. We still have, my, my husband and I still own guns. We are a hunting and fishing family still. What I believe in is that as gun owners, we should be safe with those guns and responsible. Like I said, I grew up around guns. We were taught, I was taught from a very early age of how to actually interact and behave around guns. And I did hunter safety course, which basically taught us proper handling safety, how the safety features of a gun worked, I actually tested our proficiency there. And I really believe that all responsible gun owners believe that other gun owners should have that same respect and responsibility for their guns. That's what I think. I don't think we should be taking anyone guns, anyone's guns away. I just think that we should be more responsible with them. Is that going to affect the amount of uh, shooting that we see in our schools or um, shootings that we see because of domestic violence or suicide rates? Well, when you have responsible gun owners having these guns and they store them safely and they know how to operate them properly, there's less chance that they'll end up in the hands of somebody who shouldn't have them. And that would greatly affect our suicide rate. And in some of our shootings that have occurred in high schools, it would have prevented, prevented those as well because they wouldn't have been able to get the hold of the weapons they were actually used. We also have, we have another societal problem we have to address, and that's gonna be mental illness and basically how people view each other. And that comes down to addressing this in the schools with having more school counselors and having mental health professionals available. That also kind of comes back to our healthcare system. Right. So another question that's been asked, sorry, I have to kind of toggle back and forth. All right. So um, one of the questions was, how can you protect your children that are actually attending school? Um, hopefully most of the schools at this point have gone to online schooling or taken the, the kids out of school um, because we do need to do that social distancing. And the reason why social distancing is important is not because we're actually going to stop this pandemic, it's that we're going to make it where we can treat those people who are actually affected. Um, the other day I did a video that talked about the fact that we only have 362 ICU beds in our Tarrant County. And I think many of you have heard that children aren't as susceptible to the um, more uh, serious forms of this disease, okay? so. What we need to do is stop those who are vulnerable, those who have underlying conditions from getting the disease and all ending up in the ICU at one time. So protecting our children comes down to just educating them. We don't want to panic. There's no reason to panic our children. What we need to do is be teaching them the same things that they should have been all learning all along. And that's washing your hands, washing your hands before you eat, trying to avoid touching your face constantly, which is a little bit tough for small children and basically um, not touching a lot of surfaces. And if you do touch those surfaces, cleaning your hands. And then right now we need to practice that social distancing. So trying not to be right up against each other. So hopefully schools are going to help implement this if they go back um, or if they haven't canceled yet. So um, as a parent, you can just educate your children on that proper um, hand washing and procedures and something they should have been learning all along, okay? Um, so one of the other questions we've been asked is, we already have a woman as our congressperson, okay? So what would make me better in that position as being a woman in that field? And the way I see it is that I, I've actually had a lot of mentors in my time, some women, some men, and sometimes actually some of the biggest blockades to my education or my career have been other women. 
And that is because they basically start developing this mentality that it's a man's world. And to survive in it, you have to function as a man. So they've basically changed their belief systems over to more uh, male oriented. They think that we should just be shifting and women who want to be successful should behave as men do in the workplace and in the uh, education world. And basically that means working those 60 hour weeks and uh, leaving your kids at home with nannies and babysitters. And that might not be exactly what we wanna do as women. Um, it also means that as women, sometimes we shun women who are staying at home with their kids. And that's not what we need to be doing either. As women, we need to be supporting women in whatever choices women make, whether that's staying at home with kids, having no kids, or having six kids and working. We just make, need to make sure we're supporting them. And so I think basically our current representative has adopted that mentality of it's a man's world and that is how she's gotten by, is basically playing by male rules. And we don't need male rules, rules anymore. We need rules that work for everyone. So, let's see. Um, I think Thomas, one of the other questions was how has this district changed that our opponent hasn't noticed? And I do think that has to do with the number of jobs and what people are actually doing in our district. She spends a lot of time talking about the military industry and it is, it's still an important aspect of our, our district and we plan on supporting that. I plan on supporting that. Uh, but we also have to realize that we have a, now a huge epicenter of medical care. So we have a huge number of medical providers in our area and that's not just our hospital workers and our nurses, doctors, primary care physicians, our surgery centers, but it's also pharmaceutical industry. We have some pharmaceutical industry located here. We have some research labs located in Texas 12. So we have that huge epicenter going on. We're also very diverse. There's a lot of construction going on in Texas 12. Texas 12 incorporates Parker County and part of Wise County and the west side of Tarrant and all of those areas are growing to a great extent and so there's a large amount of construction and house building going on in those areas and so we have all of those workers coming in as well. So we're very diversified economically which is a great thing to have within our district but we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that we aren't just a military uh, centered district. We are now a very diverse center that embraces our medical professions. We have a huge cultural district. We have a large number, we have a large tourist industry and we have a large construction industry. So we need to make sure that we're recognizing all that and recognizing that we are a diverse population now and not just Lockheed Martin. While though Lockheed Martin plays a very important role in our district. Another question is what can we do for our healthcare workers during this time of the pandemic? And the healthcare workers are gonna be under a severe amount of stress. And a lot of it has to do with our nurses, our respiratory therapists, our even the custodial staff within the hospital. And a lot of those people are providing their own scrubs. And so you may have seen some posts about uh, nurses kind of stripping down at the door and so one of the things that we can do locally is help support them with their laundry service. They don't get to change scrubs at the hospital like physicians do. Physicians have an actual exchange program for their scrubs in the hospital and they don't have to launder those at home. Whereas all of your other healthcare providers within those settings are actually having to bring those scrubs home. And it would be nice if we could set up some kind of uh, laundry service for those, for those people. Another thing we can help with is meals. I'm sure they're coming home exhausted and tired and not really thinking about what kind of meals they're gonna have. Um, so setting up some kind of meal service and then possibly being able to go through and drive and pick up meals would be very helpful. Anything that we can do to alleviate stress. I'm sure they're also having a hard time with childcare since their kids are home from school while they're working at the hospital. And so um, if you're a healthy individual and you can keep your house in a condition where you have less than 10 in there and follow our CDC guidelines, I would suggest um, offering to help out with that child care. Okay, 
question just came in about whether I believe that we should have a Medicare for all, a single payer system. And I do believe that all Americans should have health care. I do think that eventually we will end up with some kind of system where we have uh, Medicare for all or some kind of single payer system, but I do believe this is going to be a stepwise approach. One of the reasons is why many people actually do have great health insurance. Now, when people say um, you should be able to keep the health insurance you love, I honestly think that most people are not really in love with their health insurance. They have um, co-pays and deductibles and the actual uh, pay that they're having, what's their, their um, insurance premium is, is actually quite high. But there are people who have these kind of really top end type insurances that are really great and they want to keep those. As Americans, we like to have choice and there's a lot of countries that have ended up with systems that have allowed choice for their individuals. While you're required to have health insurance and you can actually transport that health insurance with you, you do have choices. Right now, I believe England is the only system where they have a single payer system within the European and Canadian systems. A lot of them have some kind of other mixed system where there's private insurance as well as government insurance and public options. So I think we're gonna start there and as we develop a really good health insurance system where Medicare becomes a great thing for all, then more and more people will actually choose that option and we will migrate there without any kind of force or pushing people to go that direction. One of the reasons it's important for everyone to have health care is it actually helps diversify our economy. My husband owns a small business and I have literally worked some very strange odd jobs so that my family will have insurance. I am the insurance provider. So that said, there's a lot of times where I've made choices as far as jobs, or I've made choices not to basically work from home because I needed to, we needed to have health insurance. As a small business, it was very difficult for him to have insurance or to provide insurance for employees. So basically, if you have a large corporation that's capable of offering health care, then small businesses suffer because they can't compete with those businesses. Also, a lot of people are very afraid of starting a business because that means going without their health insurance to start that business and become an entrepreneur. This frees up our society to do so many more things and to follow their dreams and, fulfill, and follow their, their crafts and their talents. So it actually would help our society and build a bigger, better diverse economy if we would offer this health insurance for everyone. Let's look at some more questions. Let's see. So with the pandemic or the, um, uh, they're asking, the question was basically, if the government can classify COVID-19 as a pan pandemic, how can they not be making testing mandatory or free even? It's life or death after all. It is life or death, and it's not really funny. Um, we have in the past actually made things free. When the polio vaccination became available, it was free. When the small va smallpox vaccination became available, it was free. It was seen as a public good. It was actually seen as saving us taxpayer money because we would offer these vaccinations and people wouldn't get sick. So obviously when a COVID-19 vaccination comes out, we need to do a broad vaccination and we need to allow it to be free. As far as testing, one of the problems that we're having with testing is the lack of test, tests that are available. And having people tested, even though they have mild symptoms, is important. And the reason it's important is to, man to maintain the spread of the virus. If a person knows they have the virus, then they're more likely to self-quarantine than if they think they have just a mild fever or a cough. The other thing that testing does for us, it allows us to know who's had the virus and who's actually survived and gotten through the whole virus so they're actually immune, which would help us in figuring out basically putting teachers back to work and putting kids back in the classroom when you have a certain percent of your population that's now immune, it's safe to go back to doing those things. Also, we know that the plasma of individuals who survived this disease and have fought it off 
have immunoglobulins that can help others survive this disease. So having that testing available does a lot more for us um, than not testing. And so it would help us basically contain the disease, it would help us get us back to a normal environment faster, and would help us treat those who are very ill if we knew people, if we had that testing available and knew who it had actually contracted and uh, had the disease. So I do believe it should be free. I think it would actually be a benefit and a cost savings to our taxpayers and a lifesaver if we would offer those free tests. Okay, the next question is, should healthcare go back to a not-for-profit model? Yes, absolutely, immediately is the answer to that. So, um, the reason why it should be nonprofit is no one should profit off your health. And literally, they're profiting off your life. If you're healthy, they're profiting off the, life, the insurance that they're selling you. If you're sick, they're, they're profiting off the fact that you're sick. So people shouldn't be making money on your life, life situation and your health situation. Not profit um, doesn't mean that you're not actually incentivizing people. People can still be paid very well to research, to develop drugs. It just means that you're not taking all that, your underlying drive isn't to have a profit that you can pass on to shareholders. It means that you're gonna take that money and you're gonna reinvest into your company reinvest in research, reinvest in new surgical procedures, reinvest in your hospitals if you're making um, money off that. So going to a nonprofit model basically improves your health care and it stops this price gouging that we're seeing, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry. I believe I was asked to readdress whether you're going to lose your Second Amendment rights. Okay, if you elect me to Congress, and the answer to that again is no, you will not. Okay, so um, I'll just go through the whole answer again. I grew up in a family that basically stretched the ends to meet, and one of the ways that we got there was my dad was a hunter, and so basically almost every every meat we had on our table, I literally can tell you that we probably had chicken or or some kind of beef on our table maybe once a week. The rest of the time it was deer or elk or antelope or some type of fish. So um, I grew up in a hunting and fishing family. My husband is still a very avid uh, sportsman and likes to hunt, so we do own guns. Um, and I think that basically what needs to happen is by growing up around guns, I was basically taught to be very responsible around guns. I took a hunter safety class um, in high school that basically taught us proper handling, um, safety, safety around weapons. We were actually tested on these things. We were taught on our accuracy. And I really think that any responsible gun owner will tell you that they would expect other gun owners to have the same respect for their weapons. And it's just not even logical to me to allow a person who knows absolutely nothing about a gun to walk into a gun store and purchase it and walk out we should have some kind of um, belief system that they're going to be responsible with those guns. Responsible gun ownership, what that does for you is knowing that guns are stored safely. They're stored in a place that, that people don't have easy access to, that children don't have access to. And what that prevents is some of the suicides we're seeing amongst our teenagers because they got into their parents' gun cabinet. It would prevent some of the accidents that we see from happening. Um, some of the mass shootings that we've seen in high schools were actually um, high school age individuals who got weapons from their parents. Um, so it would stop some of those things. Obviously it doesn't stop all of our gun violence and there are other issues and uh, things that we need to address. Okay, so uh, the next question is, I'm new to North Texas. What are issues you wish to challenge Keg Ranger on? Really, the main thing I have to challenge her on is have a town hall. Meet with your rep meet with your constituents. We're representing you. That's our job. How can we represent you 
if we're not meeting with you and finding out what it is that you're concerned about, what you think we should be talking about in Washington. We're supposed to represent you and to do that we have to communicate open and honestly with the constituents and that's probably one of my biggest problems with Kay Granger. The second problem is that she's moved to a pro-life stance, a completely pro-life without any exceptions, uh, pro-life stance. We cannot walk in another woman's shoes. We don't know what circumstances led her to make choices for abortion. And I would say literally there isn't anyone on earth that wants to see more ab abortions occur. What we want to see is for women to be able to make choices for their own bodies and to be responsible for their reproduction. The only thing that has ever worked in reducing the abortion rate has been comprehensive sex education and offering free, accessible, reliable birth control. Those are the only things that have only ever been shown to reduce the abortion rate. Having ab legals being ab abortions being illegal just drives people. It makes the wealthy actually fly to a state that can have them. It doesn't limit their access at all. And for people who can't have that option, it drives them to unsafe non-medical procedures for abortions. So I really have a problem with the, no, with the pro-life stance that she has as well. Okay, what will I do to ensure broadband internet for all and allow rural communities to have affordable internet and not be held hostage by the satellite companies? Oh, this is a perfect question for me because I really, I live in a rural area out in Wise County and internet is absolutely ridiculous out here. I have a 20 foot pole on the top of my house for us to have internet. And we put that pole up there because I literally could not function as a college professor without internet. I couldn't communicate with my students. I couldn't put lectures up in a timely fashion. I couldn't do grades from home. And so it was really affecting my life. Because I taught out in this rural area, I also realized that many of my students didn't have that access to internet either. And it was very unpredictable which was basically making their education very difficult for them because they couldn't access the, the, um, all the resources that are available online. They couldn't do their homework online and they were having great difficulty with that. I don't think everybody realizes that the lack of internet impacts our life in so many ways. And the ways that it impacts it is getting a job. How do you get a job today? A lot of places don't even take a paper application you have to apply online. That requires you not only have internet access, but that you have access to a computer. And yes, our public libraries do a fine job of that, but not everybody can access that library in a timely fashion that they need to. Our school systems have become to rely much more on the internet system. There's great access out there to so many resources that our children need. And it basically makes their learning easier. It makes it easier for their parents to help them at home with their homework, okay? And then when we talk about healthcare, telemedicine, when we have these rural communities that have hospitals shutting down, that have one doctor or one provider that needs to have a, basically a specialty consultation and we don't want them having to drive 100, 120 miles or whatever to get that specialty consultation, that could be done through telemedicine. So having that broadband access, a lot of insurance companies now allow access to the doctor through the online version. You noticed if, if you watched the White House update today, they're freeing up a lot of the access there so you can have um, better access to telecommunication. But to have that access, you have to have internet. So it is becoming basically essential, just like electricity or running water, that everybody have access to the internet. Okay, so currently you have a, you, to get a passport, a child must have both parents present. Both parents aren't always available to be present. What will you do to help change this law so caregivers, single parents can get children passports? Okay, we actually did this because we got them for our uh, children. And at the time my husband was working distance. So it took quite a bit of uh, uh, manipulation to get us all in one place at one time to get those passports. And I understand the reasoning behind it because I've also been a foster parent. And so, and I've worked in, I, when I worked in Haiti, there was some cases with uh, child custody and that kind of thing. And it can be very concerning that one parent could go get a passport 
and leave the country um, with a child. So for single parents, basically, most of the time when this occurs, you have a court order. And if there's a court order of a parent who has single custody or primary custody, that really should be all it takes to get that passport. Um, so those court documents that are in hand. Um, also, if you have a child with a birth certificate that has no second parent on there, obviously there isn't a second parent to um, ask to be present. So that birth certificate that you have to present anyway should be enough to get that passport. There's obviously things that we need to start considering as a modern society that we're going to have to work around and we need to be thinking outside the box and beyond ourselves to uh, come up with these solutions. Okay. Would you rally for stricter prosecution of sexual predators? Absolutely. I don't even know where to go on that one, just absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna stop there because that, that's just a definite yes. Okay, are you aware of what uh, what part of the federal budget the proposed individual and small business stimulus package will come from? Actually, I am not. And I've seen a lot of discussion on where that's going to come from. Um, basically, there's a lot of discussion of where are we going to pull these. Um, there's some small business loans or small business incentives. There's the what we think are going to come out to individuals. And I don't think there's been a lot of discussion that I can find on where in the budget that actually comes from. I do know that there are emergency funding that we always hold back. And so within our national budget, we and we should naturally assume that there's always a possibility of a national emergency that we're going to have to respond to. So we do hold back part of our budget for that purpose. And we are now freeing up those funds to be used in this emergency response. Now, of all that, will be actually pushed towards um, these small business incentives. It will be pushed towards the individual uh, paycheck money that's supposed to be coming out. Um, I'm not actually sure about that. Okay, and then well, I'm gonna do two last questions. One was, do you favor term limits? Definitely, okay? Because I think one of the things I'm asked quite often is, aren't you worried about going to Washington and becoming part of the machine there and kind of losing your your way? And I think when we first go, we're, we're, we all go to Washington. I think every person, I would hope every person who runs is, um, go, is going for a reason. They feel like they can make a change. They feel like they can do something for the better. And it becomes such a cumbersome process to continually hold up and do what's right and push against um, the norm and the flow and the money, the huge amount of money that comes towards these politicians, it becomes very difficult to be that person who stands up for 24 years for what's right. It also becomes difficult to stay in tune with your district as you're spending more and more time in, in Washington to stay in tune with your constituents and what's going on. And the further you move away from normal life and normal careers, the further you get away from what's gonna actually help your constituents. So I think term limits are a definite thing that we need to be moving towards. Um, obviously, if you're very good at your job, there are many other things you can do in the government to assist your poli the politicians who get elected after your term is over. Now, what I wanna say about term limits is that for us to have term limits, you have to vote for them first. Before I can vote for them, you have to vote for them. We have to vote. We have to vote out the long-term incumbents because they're not going to vote to retire themselves. We're going to have to retire them. So your vote in November is your vote for term limits. Oh, here's a good question. So somebody asked me what I'm doing to kill the time to self-quarantine. So while I'm self-quarantining, I'm actually staying pretty busy because we moved all of my classes online. So I've been doing a whole lot of this in front of the camera work for my students as well. Uh, putting lectures online, conversing with students, trying to get them ready to go online because a lot of them did not anticipate having to take an online class. So I'm actually doing a lot of professor work from home. Um, I've also been trying to stay healthy. I do my elliptical in the morning, walk the dogs in the afternoon. My husband, on the other hand, works in construction. 
and he's going a little bit stir crazy and I don't know if you can hear it but there's some hammering and sawing going on in the background because he decided to rip out our carpet and replace it with hardwood floor so that's what's going on at our house during self-quarantine Another question is, do I support the Green New Deal? I do support the Green New Deal. I think we need to make our environment priorities. I think we need to go through the new, new Green Deal and look at it for realistic, scientifically provable things that we can actually do. Carbon emission is definitely something we can approach. Um, that comes through changing off fossil fuels, moving to electric vehicles where possible. Um, driving less, having public transportation that is uh, environmentally friendly, which includes, we basically need to support our infrastructures and the development of infrastructure. Uh, people talk a lot about, uh, I saw somebody complaining about the public transport system in this area, and it wasn't because of lack of public transport system, it was actually because we're advocating for more public transport and then those buses and, and subs or what it trains are empty. Well, when you make more of them and you basically show where it's cost effective to actually be using that transport and that it's actually time effective, the things that you can do on your commute, if you're not having to concentrate on driving, um, makes it much more efficient. So we could actually connect all of our rural communities through Fort, to Fort Worth through a train system. I mean, I love love the train systems in the East and in, in Europe, and I think we should definitely promote that here. So moving away from those carbon emissions, fossil fuels, they've responded in the past, they responded in the 70s to removing subsidies and removing subsidies from them and pushing them towards renewable fuels actually made all those oil, large oil companies start pushing towards um, developing and researching renewable energy. So we need to push towards that as well. Um, one of the things I want to address environmentally though is our plastic usage and I don't think we're near uh, where we need to be on that. We're finding microplastics nearly in every single environment now. Plastics is literally something, I mean, we think we should be able to do without them and I literally in January was basic, my, was my New Year's, New Year's resolution to start doing without plastics and it's just so prevalent in our lives, it's everywhere. And I thought, you know, I go to a restaurant, I bring my own straw, and the waitress sticks the straw on the table before I can say no thanks. And I know that that straw is gonna end up in the trash or that plastic lid or whatever. So we need to basically really concentrate as a, as a population on getting rid of our plastics. So um, the Green New Deal, we definitely need to be moving that way. Um, we can do so much to save our planet right now, and it just, requires us to think new. It doesn't even require us to sacrifice. It requires us to think in a new fashion, and we can do that. I told you two new questions, but there's there's a lot of more all of a sudden coming in. So, um, so the question is, te technology has rapidly changed in many ways, yet our schools have stayed relatively the same. What is your plan to modernize the school system? Okay. So I think one of the things we've done is we've expected um, kids to actually kind of pick this up on their own as far as technology goes. And one of those cut things comes when we start putting classes online. And one of the things we saw with putting classes online was that we assumed because many of our students grew up with screens in their hands, okay, they had the iPhones, they were constantly on the computer, they were playing games, that they actually understood how, um, technology functioned and worked. And it's not really the case. Um, they, know, they know how to plug in the game and how to push the buttons, but they don't really understand the technology behind it. They don't know how to develop some of the programs. They don't know how to manipulate those programs. So while we're putting technology in their hands, we're not really actually teaching them how to use that. And more and more, we're moving to a more advanced technological society where a lot of our jobs are being automated. A lot of our jobs are very computer driven. Uh, my son is a diesel mechanic and it requires a lot of actual technology there. Our, the trucks have huge amounts of technology and computer systems in them um, that they have to learn. So how we do this with our secondary, with our school system 
is we start introducing not just screens. We've done a lot of putting textbooks online, but we need to actually challenge kids to program things, to learn how to write that computer language. It's learning a foreign language and they're very good at it. They're very good at learning these languages and these skills. And we basically put that through and we push down this technology all the way through. Just because we don't understand it doesn't mean they're not capable of learning it. And so we just need to make sure we're putting that in the school systems and learning it. And how do we do that? We subsidize and we offer grants for best practices. So we give grants out to schools to try new things, to see what works, to develop ideas that they'll share out with other school districts and bring those into our school districts. All right. So now I guess we're now ready for the last question. So our last question now is how do you contribute? That was literally a question that y'all asked that I didn't bring up and I really appreciate that question. So our campaign obviously needs funding as any campaign does. We really like to talk about how we want the money out of politics and yet we're still things that we have to do. We have to be able to communicate with you. We have to be able to get literature out. We need to be able to put yard signs out so other people learn about our campaign. We need to be able to have a space where you can come and pick up those things where you can interact with our team. So we do need funding. While we're going to do our very best to stay economically responsible, we do need you to donate. So you can donate through Act Blue. You can find that link on our Facebook page, our Twitter page. You can find it on our web page. Or you can also donate physically by writing us a check and that address is on the web page. The web page is lisawelch.org. Thank you, thank you for attending. I hope to see you out there in the future.